Now that we've discussed orthonormal bases and seen how nice it can be to work with one, we're prepared for a fundamental theorem. Today, we're going to prove this theorem here, and in doing so, establish the Gram-Schmidt process. We'll discuss that process, go through an example of applying it, and that'll be it. This video has chapters, you can skip around as you please, and if you haven't already, I really recommend checking out my video on orthogonal projections in subspaces before watching this. I'll leave a link to that in the description. Now, the theorem. Every non-zero, finite-dimensional inner product space has an orthonormal basis. So that's a relief. An orthonormal basis is a very nice thing, and we're going to prove that for any non-zero, finite-dimensional inner product space, there is an orthonormal basis. The proof is going to be a step-by-step -step construction showing exactly how to obtain such a basis. The process that's outlined in this proof is the Gram-Schmidt process process. Let's get into it. Let W be a non-zero finite dimensional subspace of an inner product space, and let this set be a basis for that subspace W. So U1 through UR are the basis vectors. We're going to show how to obtain an orthogonal basis from those basis vectors. We'll call the vectors in the orthogonal basis V1 through VR. Now the theorem is about orthonormal bases, but of course it will be sufficient to show how to obtain an orthogonal basis because if we have an orthogonal basis, we can just normalize its vectors to obtain an orthonormal basis. All right, now step one is super easy. The first vector in our orthogonal basis is just going to be the first vector from the given basis. We have a subspace, we know it has a basis, and we're gonna take the first vector from that basis as the first vector in our orthogonal basis. In the subsequent steps of this proof, we're going to continue to take these vectors from the original basis, but we're only going to take the parts of them that are orthogonal to what we already have. So for step two, we'll take the component of U2, the second basis vector, that's orthogonal to the space W1 spanned by that first vector V1. You may wonder why are we wording it this way. Why say that we're taking the component orthogonal to the space instead of just saying that we're taking the component orthogonal to this single vector v1 that spans the space? The reason is that in the following steps it will be more important to discuss the space because we'll have multiple vectors spanning it. But again for this step v2 our second orthogonal basis vector is going to be the component of u2 that's orthogonal to this space. How we calculate calculate that is by taking u2 and subtracting its projection onto the space. So if we take the projection of u2 on w1 and subtract that from u2, we'll be left with the component of u2 that's orthogonal to the space, hence orthogonal to our other basis vector. And that looks like this. So this term here is the projection of u2 onto the space spanned by v1. Again, check out my video on orthogonal projections on subspaces if this looks totally unfamiliar to you. So now we have our first two orthogonal basis vectors, V1 and V2, but there is something worth considering. What if in this process of computing V2, we've actually calculated a zero vector? What if V2 is equal to zero? Well, based on this equation, how we constructed V2, if V2 is zero, we could add this projection to that left side and we would have this equation that u2 equals that projection. But v1 here we know is u1, so we could replace v1 with u1 and then we see why this can't be true because we would have u2 equals some multiple of u1. That's not possible because u1 and u2 are basis vectors. They have to be linearly independent. So one can't be a multiple of the other. So we're all good there. Our second orthogonal basis vector is not a zero vector. We'll go through this same reasoning again in the next step to verify that vector is not a zero vector, except it will be slightly more involved just because the computation is going to get a little bit more complicated. But here is that step three. As you might be expecting at this point, we're just taking 
taking the third basis vector from the given basis, and we're going to take the part of it that's orthogonal to the space that's spanned by the first two vectors we already have, v1 and v2. In this way, we get the part of u3 that's orthogonal to our pre-existing orthogonal basis vectors. Again, this is just going to require a projection calculation. So for our third basis vector, v3, we just take the given third basis vector and subtract its projection on w2, the space spanned by our pre-existing orthogonal basis vectors. This gives us the component of u3 that's orthogonal to w2. And that looks like this. This in parentheses is just that projection. Recall from our discussion of orthogonal projections that what we're looking at here, the projection of u3 on w2, is just the sum of the projections of u3 on the basis vectors of w2. That's its projection on v1, that's its projection on v2, which looks like this in a picture. You take the projection of this vector onto a basis vector, project it on the other basis vector, and then if you add those projections, you get the projection onto the subspace. Again, we should ask the question, what if v3 is equal to zero? Is it possible that this construction produces a zero vector? Again, if v3 was equal to zero, then we could add this projection over to the left side, and then we would have this equation, u3 equals that projection. v1 we could replace with u1, and v2 we could replace with this. This is exactly what v2 equals, just replacing that v1 with what it equals, which is u1. Thus, we're writing u3 entirely in terms of a linear combination of the u vectors, which are vectors from a basis that u3 is in. So again, what we show here is that if v3 is equal to zero, then u3 can be written as a linear combination of u1 and u2. But u1, u2, and u3 are all basis vectors, so they have to be linearly independent. So something like this cannot be possible. Hence, v3 is not equal to zero. Hopefully, you can predict step four at this point. We'll just take the component of the fourth given basis vector, u4, that is orthogonal to the space spanned by the first three orthogonal basis vectors that we've constructed so far. So what is v4? Well, it's u4 minus u4's projection on the pre-existing orthogonal vectors, which is starting to get pretty messy, but it's u4 minus, there's the projection. Each term is just the projection of u4 on one of the basis vectors for w3. So the projection on v1, the projection on v2, and the projection on v3. In this way, we get a fourth vector orthogonal to the first three. And again, v4 we know is not equal to zero, because if it were, then we could write u4 as a linear combination of u1 u2 and u3 that can't be possible because all those u's are basis vectors hence they are linearly independent and clearly we could continue this process for r steps to obtain an orthogonal set of non-zero basis vectors v1 through vr at each point we would be taking one of the given basis vectors u1 through ur but only taking the component of it that's orthogonal to the other vectors in our orthogonal basis so we could get an orthogonal orthogonal basis, and then we could just normalize all of those vectors to get an orthonormal basis. So divide each of the vectors by their norms. And so by construction, we have established this theorem. Every non-zero finite dimensional inner product space has an orthonormal basis, and this is exactly how it can be constructed. That proof, in essence, was the Gram-Schmidt process, though there were some additional details since it was a proof. Here's the process just called down to the steps. To convert a basis, u1 through ur, into an orthogonal basis, v1 through vr, we just perform these computations. v1 is u1, v2 is the component of u2 that is orthogonal to v1, v3 is the component of u3 that is orthogonal to v1 and v2, 
two, or more precisely, the space spanned by them, and so on. We continue for our steps to obtain an orthogonal basis. If desired, we could actually normalize the vectors at each step so that at the end of this whole thing we get an orthonormal basis. Alternatively, of course, as we said, you could just get the orthogonal basis and then normalize it to get the orthonormal basis. We're going to finish with an example of applying the Gram-Schmidt process to obtain an orthonormal basis. Let R cubed have the Euclidean inner product. We'll use the Gram-Schmidt process to transform this basis of vectors into an orthonormal basis. Notice how these vectors u1, u2, and u3 are not orthogonal. For example, you could compute u1 dot u2 and find it equals 3, not 0. The vectors are not orthogonal. Nor are they unit vectors. For example, the norm of u1 is root 2. But even though this basis is neither orthonormal nor orthogonal, we can apply the Gram-Schmidt process to convert it into an orthonormal basis. Step 1 is easy. The first basis vector in our orthogonal basis is just going to be the original first basis vector. So v1 equals u1, which is 1, 1, 0. Now again, we could normalize this vector right now if we wanted to, but that would make the rest of our computations a little bit messier. So when doing this by hand, probably best to avoid that. Now for our vector v2, we'll just compute the component of u2 that is orthogonal to the space spanned by v1. But note I'm calling this v2 prime. That's because we're actually going to modify this vector slightly in a way that will make the rest of the computations a little bit easier. Doing this computation, u2 is 1, 2, 0. The dot product of u2 with v1 is 1 times 1, which is 1, plus 1 times 2, which is 3 once you add them together, so 3. And then the norm of v1 squared is the root of 2 squared, which is just 2. And so that's getting multiplied by v1, which we see there. Once you do this subtraction, we have 1 minus 3 halves, which is negative half, 2 minus 3 halves, which is positive half, and 0. Now, scaling this vector up or down isn't going to change its direction. It's not going to change the fact that it's orthogonal to v1, which is why we could normalize it if we want. But a better idea would be to eliminate the fractions and just worry about fixing its length at the end of this process. So we did the computations in the usual way to find v2 prime, but let's actually say v2, the vector in our orthogonal basis, is v2 prime just scaled up by a factor of 2. That way we get rid of those fractions. Then v2 is this vector. And again, we'll just worry about normalizing them all at the end. Finally, our last orthogonal basis vector is v3, and that's going to be the component of u3 that is orthogonal to the space spanned by v1 and v2. And that looks like this. So u3 minus that projection. Note that back in the proof of the theorem, I used parentheses, so we had minus the projection and minus the projection, which is why you saw this addition. But in writing out the Gram-Schmidt process, I distributed the negatives. So you have minus this, minus that, minus this, minus that, minus that, and so on. Same thing in this worked out example. We have minus the projection on V1, minus the projection on V2. Do all the arithmetic and we end up here. These are just dot products and basic vector operations, so I won't talk through them. We end up with this vector, 0, 0, 2. That is our third orthogonal basis vector. It doesn't have length 1, but now is a fine time to fix that. So this here is our orthogonal basis consisting of those three orthogonal basis vectors that we just constructed with the Gram-Schmidt process. Just as an example, we could dot this vector with this one, we'd get negative 1 plus 1, which is 0. These vectors are orthogonal. In order to normalize the basis to obtain an orthonormal basis, we just need to find their norms and then divide. The norm of the vector v1 is root 2. The norm of the vector v2 is root 2. And the norm of the vector v3 is 
to. Then dividing each vector by its norm, we obtain this orthonormal basis. These three vectors are orthogonal to each other and they are all unit vectors. On screen now in red, blue, and green, you can see what these orthonormal basis vectors look like in the context of R cubed sketched out with its traditional unit vectors. So this looks just like our usual frame for R cubed, but with a slight rotation. But that is the Gram-Schmidt process and a proof of this important theorem. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions and be sure to check out my linear algebra course and linear algebra exercises playlists in the description for more. If you find my videos helpful, please consider supporting what I do by joining Wrath of Math as a channel member. You can get early and exclusive access to select videos and extra practice. And if you join at the premium tier or above, you can access the lecture notes that I use in my courses. Thanks for watching. Stressed out, squeaky, I'm stressed out. Sounds like you've been stressed out. Tell me what you're stressed about. Mama. Stressed out, honey, I've been stressed out lately. Don't know what's what, don't know what I'm stressed about. Stressed out, sweetie, I'm stressed out. Sounds like you've been stressed out. Tell me what you're stressed about.